Let's put that there. Can everyone hear me okay? Great. Okay, cool. Okay, so next up we've got Dr. Rogers from the University of Sheffield. Great, thanks. thanks so much for having me. Like uh, a couple of the other speakers have mentioned, it's quite a humbling experience to be invited to talk at GPSS, especially since I'm neither a mathematician nor a computer scientist, so I'll, I'll apologize a little bit. But I am a lover of the Gaussian process, uh, which is actually the source of quite a lot of ridicule among my, uh, my colleagues, that basically when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like it could be fitted with the Gaussian process. Um, but I'm going to try today to talk a little bit about how, in an engineering context, we can use Gaussian processes, um, not just to create really nice models, but also to try and learn a little bit about the world around us. Um, yeah, let's get cracking, shall we? Does that sound okay? Good, okay. Um, right, so, so stuff I, I care about. I'm sorry, Steve, I'm someone who puts lots of sensors on a plane, um, and I'd already made the slide before you said that that wasn't that exciting a thing to do. Uh, so uh, this is the, the lab that we have in Sheffield, or one of the labs that we have in Sheffield. If you want to find out about it, uh, you can check out um, lvv.ac.uk. If anyone wants to come and visit, you're really welcome. Uh, we'd love to show you around. Um, and if you're interested in the data, also um, just email me. Um, a lot of this data is already online. So if you want to try and fit uh, models to some of this data, please have a go and do better than we do. Um, so what are we doing here? Um, this is an aircraft, uh, and we're performing a vibration test on this aircraft. So what we're doing is we're shaking the plane, uh, and then we're looking at how it responds. And it, in this setup, this is some testing that hopefully um, some PhD students and postdocs are doing right now. Um, they're probably actually having coffee somewhere. Uh, but um, what we're doing here is we're shaking it in six locations and we're measuring about 150 channels of output data. Um, and, and what we'd really like to be able to do then is, is a few things. So the first thing I'd like to be able to do is maybe to be able to predict how this plane might respond while it's in flight. That's an interesting problem because obviously it's not in flight when we do the measurements. That's quite a, uh, an interesting scenario. The other thing I'd like to do is maybe to learn a little bit about the physics of this system. So um, one of the challenges that you have if you look at something complicated like this is that it can be very hard to write down uh, the first principles model of this structure. And stuff like finite element um, really does help um, but there's certain things that are just very difficult to model, even if you have these kind of computational tools. For example, uh, in the landing gear, we have some suspension, and there's all kinds of fluids and, and stuff going on in there that I really can't model. I don't know what the equation should be. And then the last thing is that we, we, we try to use the models that we build to help engineers make better decisions. So we try and do things like detect if something has gone wrong uh, on this aircraft. Um, usually that will be sort of a slow degradation as stuff wears out. And, and we call that structural health monitoring. Other people call it predictive uh, maintenance. Um, if you're interested in that kind of thing, especially uh, across populations of structures, so say a little bit like Steve had, where you have very many assets which may or may not be similar to each other, how do you uh, learn about which ones are working OK and which ones aren't? We have a very nice project looking at that. And again, you can check that out online. It's uh, pbshm.ac.uk. And um, we're not talking about that today. Um, what I'd like to talk about today is a much simpler problem. Uh, and I, like I promised to Rich, I would bring a demonstration. So who has seen one of these things before? Yeah, great. So this is really fun. And uh, it's really just here that when you get bored, I can come over and tap it again, and it will be exciting. Um, so this is just two pendulum, and they're connected together. And if I start it from some small initial condition, you know, like I just pull it a little bit away, it swings kind of like you'd expect, right? Um, and it's very easy for me to write down the equations which govern this system. If I pull it a little bit higher up and I let go, it starts doing some really funky stuff. And despite the fact that, broadly speaking, it's only governed by two ordinary differential equations, not the millions that, that Steve has, it starts behaving in a really weird way um, that we're not really going to talk about, but it's quite eye-catching. <laughs> and so 
Um, the reason this is happening is we see very complex time series behavior being generated by relatively simple equations. And the problem that I have in my work is that often what people give me is maybe they've put a sensor on the tip of one of these and they let it go. That one's actually been quite nicely behaved. That's exciting. The cool thing about this is that um, infinitesimally small changes in the initial conditions cause big change in the response. That's exciting. Um, but maybe someone put a sensor on here and they said, oh, I collected you hours and hours and hours of data. Fit a, fit a model for me. Uh, fit a model that will predict what this will do in the future. <laughs> Woohoo! Um, but what they often don't tell me is, say, the initial conditions or how they pushed it. And they almost certainly don't tell me the equations that were governing it. So all I get is a time series. And I, I, I think, OK, how do I build a model of that? Uh, and then they go, OK, I don't just want a model. I want a digital twin. Um, OK. <laughs> Here's Jordi LaForge, who I think is a much uh, more palatable character than Drake. Um, so I prefer this template. And there's a lot of arguments about defining what is a digital twin. Uh, and so there's kind of a camp that believe, you know, digital twins are just making better emulators of physical machines. It's probably a little bit more than that. There's a camp that believes digital twins are sort of where models also run the world for us. They probably also have it a little bit wrong. And I don't really want to get into the debate. But what I'm interested in is understanding the motivating reasons why people might want a digital twin. And ultimately, for me, it boils down to this idea that uh, when we talk about having a digital twin, it's a response to the world around us changing. That we have more data, we have more models, and we demand more of both of those, especially in engineering. So people obviously would like I know, I want for very little money, very quickly, to understand exactly what my asset is doing and to be recommended the best option to save me the most money. That's obviously what we've always wanted. And at the moment, we're calling that a digital twin. Where the challenge is, is in trying to combine all the components that you need in order to provide that to someone. You need very strong computational modeling expertise. You need strong knowledge of how to handle data. You probably need some decision theory in there to help people to interpret what to do with those results. And you definitely, in my opinion, need some concept of uncertainty and a way of communicating that to people, which I think is all stuff that we've touched on this week. That's all I wanted to really say on digital twins. And I put it in because I was neither talking about emulators nor surrogates. And the title of the workshop had digital twin in it. So let me talk about the actual problem I want to, I want to solve. OK, so this is the acceleration of a dynamic system. It's not the double pendulum. This is a different, uh, it happens to be nonlinear. But what I've done is I've simulated it just because it was easier than going to the lab. Um, I've simulated a system for some period of time here, 60 milliseconds or so, not very long. Um, and I measured the acceleration of that system. And I said, great, I'll collect my data. And then because we're at GPSS, we'll fit a Gaussian process to that data. And I have a nonlinear curve, and it looks kind of wiggly. In fact, it looks like a sample from a squared exponential kernel, so that's nice for me. And it has zero mean. So import gpy. Actually, not import gpy in this case. Import jax. Write your own gp, because you you know, being silly. Um, and then we condition on this data, and we produce a predictive posterior. And what you can't see is that the red line here is the, the measured data, and the blue line is the mean of my Gaussian process. And there is a confidence interval. It's just really small, right? Because my training data is really close to where I'm looking at what's going on. OK, great. I'm GRU, by the way. Fit the Gaussian process. And I'm feeling like I'm going to dominate the world because you know, I've, in about uh, 15 lines in Python, I've managed to make this beautiful model. And I didn't have to choose what order of polynomial to use, which is great. OK, then we extrapolate into the future. Oh, extrapolate. And at this point, you run into a bit of an argument, depending on who you talk to, about whether this model is working. So hands up if you think that my Gaussian process model is working. <laughs> All the people who've used GPs for a few years have got their hand up. Hands up if you think my Gaussian process model is not working. OK, there were some more people. Uh, hands up if you just don't care. I guess that's everyone who didn't. 
put it up. So the Gaussian process has done exactly what it promised me to do, right? <laughs> it, it, I've started to walk away from my training data, and because my notion of how to predict is based on how close I am to previous observations, as measured in the kernel, it starts to say, hang on a minute, I haven't seen anything like this before because you're moving into the future and time is the input, so I'm just going to return to the prior, which was a very reasonable prior as well, remember? Zero mean squared exponential. Actually, this is a, no, this is a squared exponential kernel. It doesn't matter. So the GP is doing exactly what it's meant to do. Remember that, um, as Carl Henrik said, this kind of sausage plot's a bad idea because if I pulled samples from that GP, probably some of them would look a little bit like the red signal that I, that I want. My issue is I just don't know which one it is. And so if I'm thinking about trying to fit data which was generated by a dynamic system, and when I say dynamic system, I just mean the underlying data generating process was either an ODE or a PDE. Um, so it was something a bit like this. You know, there's two simple equations, but I see something exciting in the time series. When that's the case, I'm in a bit of a pickle if I want to use Gaussian processes because I can't use time because most interesting stuff I want to do happens in the future because I already know about the past. Uh, and so I need to kind of think about different ways to handle this problem. Um, and that's what I'd like to talk a little bit about today, if that's okay. Are people happy with what the issue is? Okay. And then eventually, maybe I will take over the world, or I'll just become another minion in the machine of academia. Okay. Yeah. I can't use time because the, what I care about is what's going to happen to my plane or my bridge in the future. So if I use time, and I, I'm not emulating here. So this is, I've collected data in the lab, and I want to predict what will happen in a week's time. The problem is if I use time as the input, and I use like the date today as an input, yeah, uh, if I use time as an input, all the interesting stuff happens outside of my training set because I already know what happened in the bits I've observed. Um, and I'm not interpolating in time. There are t there, I'll show you actually we will do that in a bit. But <laughs> like, in this case, the reason that I have a challenge is because I care about what happens in the future so if I use time as an input, I immediately leave my training set. And that's kind of going to cause me some problems. OK. Does that clear it up a little bit? Great. OK. Um, I was aware, again, that I was a mechanical engineer in a room full of people smarter than me. And I thought I'd do a quick review of maybe some first year mechanical engineering mechanics. Um, so who has seen a diagram something like this before at some point in there? Under oh, perfect. Great. We'll go quickly then. Um, so we have a mass, we have a spring attached to it, and we have one of these viscous dash pots, which is kind of a, a way energy leaves the system. And uh, just for some notation, I'm going to talk about the X being the, the displacement of that mass away from some equilibrium. So that's wherever it would sit at rest. And I apply some force F to that. And if you use your uh, favorite way of understanding the system, like Newton's second laws and for example, you can recover a very nice ordinary differential equation. Okay? And that's not, not too difficult. So we have some inertia term. That's the MA part of F equals MA. And then the other bits are the forces acting on that mass to balance out what's going on. Um, and so we can arrive at some kind of relative, well, this is, a, this is a simple equation, right? And we all know how to solve this, I'll say, because we've all taken first year maths. Um, and that's very nice. What happens then if suddenly my spring wasn't like a nice linear spring, so it stops obeying a Hooke's law? So, you know, if I compress a spring too much and the coils touch each other, then suddenly it will become a lot stiffer, and this will become a nonlinear function, but still of the displacement. And the good news is that you can, you can still write down, I've kind of butchered the notation here because I dropped the CX dot into that F on the bottom, but you can still write down a similar kind of equation where we're still going to balance the inertia, which is the mass times the acceleration, against all of the forces in the system. And those are both the internal forces, and that's stuff like the spring and the damper. I'll call those internal because they're kind of part of the system. 
and the external force F, which is what I do when I push the thing. So it's a little bit more complicated for the pendulum, but kind of the internal forces are a bit like it's so the gravity, which is sort of internal, sort of external, and the external force is me pushing it. Okay. And I can still write down an equation, and then I can solve that equation. And just like Steve said, when we have these kind of ODEs, it's actually relatively straightforward to solve them. People have been doing that for a very long time. Um, there's some cool stuff being done in probabilistic numerics about different ways to do it. But ultimately, um, we can solve these equations, which is all well and good. Except, in order to write this down, I need to know the physics. I need to be able to look at that object and say, OK, well, this is cubic, or this is... Um, quadratic or whatever. And unfortunately for me, in a lot of the cases I'm interested in, I, I can't do that. I don't have access to the underlying physical principles that are driving my system. Um, you know, and we have an idea of some of them, uh, but not all of them. And stuff like friction, for example, is, is just really, really hard. I don't think there is the correct model out there, even if I wanted to solve this. And so a lot of my interest is in what happens if we know what I'm seeing is driven by an equation that looks kind of like this, but I have no idea what that f is. Hmm, an unknown function. I wonder where this is going, right? Hey, <laughs> I have a really good way of fitting unknown functions, right? I, I already showed you it fits the time series really well. Or you've been here for a few days and now life is good. And so we have a method for performing flexible nonlinear Bayesian regression when our problems look like this. Y is some function of the input x plus some additive noise. Um, and there's stuff we can do. We can swap the likelihood around, and we can try and solve things and, uh, with non-Gaussian likelihoods. And that also works really well. But the fundamental problem I have is that this is modeling a function which is a single line. So when I have something like a mass on a spring, if I'm pushing that, and I just take how hard I push it, I actually just get a point cloud if I look at the response because of this dynamic behavior, because of the fact that there's these derivatives that are actually governing the behavior. And that makes it really hard for me to just directly apply a Gaussian process onto that data. And then here's a nice plot that Carl Henrik would probably be more happy with, uh, which I won't do any further in the talk. I'm very sorry. Um, but you get the idea. And just remember, when you see the confidence interval, that there are functions that live that are that is smoothly vary inside it. OK, so here, thank you, Mauricio. First of all, um, in, in 2009, uh, Mauricio said, OK, well, let's have a cool way of thinking about this problem would be, OK, what if we thought about data that was generated by this kind of process, that it was governed by some ODE, in this case, a linear ODE, and actually, the, what, the thing that is missing, or the thing I'm going to model with my Gaussian process, is whatever the driving input to that ODE is. OK, so this, was a, and, and this is a Gaussian process latent force model. Um, and it's a really lovely model. Uh, and it works really well. And I'll show you a, a mechanical setting where it's going to be very useful to us. Um, for me, however, and I'm sorry now, Maurizio, <laughs> there's, a, there's an elegant thing you can do in this case um, where there was some nice work done by Yuni Hartkainen and Simusaka, where they show that if you have a Gaussian process with a 1D input, you can rewrite that Gaussian process as a linear Gaussian state space model. And that's um, it's really exciting, and I'll try to explain why in a second. But ultimately, it means you can compute exact Gaussian processes on millions of data points uh, if you have a stationary covariance and the input is 1D and, and a few other things. But it's an exact solution for the GP uh, that avoids inverting a kernel matrix. And that means we can operate this type of model on stuff that's, that's really quite a lot of data, um, which is nice. And then um, I'll explain that once you know that the GP can be written as a state space model, it's very natural to couple it with especially linear ODEs in this state space form. And I'll explain that a little bit. OK, are people with me still? Is anyone bored? <laughs> OK. So here's the fundamental trick. Uh, and this is the trick that um, uh, Hartikainen and Saka published in 2010. 
Um, it's, a, it's a nice paper to go and read, but there's quite a lot of maths that I'm going to skip in the talk. And the trick will be to turn your Gaussian process that's order n cubed computationally, and for me, more importantly, order n cubed in memory, um, into a linear uh, state space model, uh, which is order n. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start with my covariance function, which is a covariance function in time. So I have time as an input, and that's the only input to my process. I'm going to work out what would be the spectral density of that covariance function. So this arrow you can do with a Fourier transform. So if you, or you could look it up in Rasmussen's textbook, which is kind of more exciting. Once you have the spectral density, you then have to do a little bit of algebra and to convert that spectral density into a rational transfer function in the frequency domain. And then using our knowledge of the way that transfer functions work, we can write down an equivalent continuous time state space model. And this is a linear continuous time state space model, which is actually also a stochastic differential equation. Uh, because it's a linear stochastic differential equation, uh, we can discretize it exactly and in closed form. And what you arrive at is that the solution to this model is actually just the Kalman filter, which is a really cool thing to, to realize and, and really exciting stuff um, for people like me. And so we're going to use this trick to try and solve a few problems um, in the kind of dynamic world that I was talking about. Yeah, sure. It's a, it's a linear Kalman filter. Yeah. No. What are the <laughs> uh, you can only have a one-dimensional input. That input has to obey the Markov property, I believe. Uh, and your kernel has to be stationary. You have to have zero mean. So there's quite a few restrictions. So that's why not everyone is just doing this. That's why variational sparse GP still exist, right? <laughs> because if this just worked for everything, it's, it's clearly, you know, it's exact. So yeah, that's great. I'm not approximating the posterior here. Um, but it's quite restricted what you can make this work on. The Markovian assumption means you can't use RBF kernels, for example. Uh, there's a different reason you can't use the RBF, oh, okay. <laughs> which is that to use the RBF, the size of the state in this state space model has to be infinite mm -hmm. because it's infinitely differentiable. So what you find is that the size of the state or the number of hidden states in your state space model will be equal to the number of times differentiable that your kernel is, uh, maybe plus one. So you can't use a Gaussian. No, you can't use a Gaussian kernel. Um, so we use Maton kernels, which I think is pretty much OK. If you need something that's really smooth, right, you could just take a Maton kernel and make it 20 times differentiable. And it's <laughs> basically indistinguishable from the RBF kernel. So if you want something that's really, really smooth, you could, you could do that. Um, OK. And I, I, obviously, I've kind of skipped the actual maths of how you do this and replaced it with a lot of arrows. The good news is you can look up what the state space models are for various kernels, and that makes your life quite easy. You can look them up in, uh, in the paper, or, or um, Arne Solin and Simisaka have a book called Applied Stochastic Differential Equations, and they've done a lot of kernels in there. You can just look them up. Okay. So I'm going um, to talk to you about three ways we might want to use this. Um, and then and some extensions that make it kind of interesting. So I'm not just freeloading on the hard work of Mauricio and the guys in Finland. Um, so during my PhD, I was working for a company who were interested in, or working with a company who were interested in uh, structures a little bit like this one, uh, which is in the North Sea. Um, and you really don't want these things to fall over, right? <laughs> Hopefully that's something we can all agree on. Um, and one of the problems is that what's driving the end of life of these structures, and just for reference, there's about 360 offshore structures that are at the end of their design life in the North Sea at the moment. You want to know roughly how healthy they are. Like, you want to understand whether they're in good condition or bad condition, a lot like the earthworks, right? You really don't want them falling down unexpectedly onto the rails. This is, a, this is an oil rig, right? Uh, yeah, this one is, yeah. Yeah. We also work with wind turbines. We're not the bad guys, please. <laughs> um, yeah, we're d now all wind. <laughs> okay. 
Um, so, uh, uh, and what's driving this thing to wear out is um, something called fatigue. Um, and fatigue is basically like structures getting tired because you've moved them around too much. So like if you take a paper clip and you bend it back and forward and very many times, even though each bend is less than the strength of the metal, eventually it will wear out and it will snap. Uh, and what's driving that fatigue is how hard the waves are pushing the bottom of this structure. The reason I don't put a wind turbine here is because people always say, oh, but what about the wind pushing it? And the, it which is true. That's complicated. So here, basically, the waves are driving the motion of the structure in the sea. Uh, and that's what's causing it to accumulate this fatigue damage. And, and that's happening to everything. That's not something you should be scared about. That's just a fact of life. Um, but it's very, very hard to measure what the force is that's being applied by the fluid onto the structure. So you can imagine um, that it would be very difficult to simulate this because I need to run very hard, like large computational fluid dynamic simulations. And even then, I don't know the exact waves that have hit that thing. I only know statistically which ones are probable. Uh, and if I put sensors there, unfortunately, they get washed away <laughs> after not very long. So it's hard for me to directly measure the thing that I care about in the system. But I know that it is dynamic and it's governed by some ODEs. And I have an unknown thing that's pushing it around. And Maurizio will be happy because that sounds a lot like the model that he came up with. And I was very happy as well. Only happy in the last six months of my PhD when I found that model after I faffed around for three years. But anyway. <laughs> um, and so the first thing I'm going to show you is just that what Mauricio proposed works really well for a practical problem. That's the first thing I'll show you. The second thing I'm going to show you is that we'll extend that and we'll say, OK, can we then solve this problem of not knowing what my ODE is that I want to, that my data was generated by? And then the third thing I'll show you is just a few extensions that we're working on at the moment that aren't published yet. Um, so if you're watching the video, please don't publish them before me. <laughs> okay. Okay, the first problem then is this unknown load problem. And um, it's nice to start with this because it introduces the kind of concepts um, of what we're trying to do. So um, what I've done here is I've actually just moved to a case where I have a set of ODEs rather than a single ODE. Yeah? Sorry, the question about the previous one. Uh, you said that you can't, you can't put sensors on the thing. Uh, so ah, I can put sensors at the top. Ah. So I can measure like, the acceleration response at the top of the structure, because that's quite easy, because the waves aren't going to wash them away. What I can't measure is the direct thing I'm interested in which is how hard the waves are pushing on. So I can measure something that's related, but it's related through the ODEs that govern the dynamics of the system. Um, and so here I have now a set of ODEs because that structure is obviously a lot more complicated than just one mass on a spring, but I'm going to assume that I could represent it as lots of masses connected by lots of springs. And that's effectively what finite element does when you're analyzing the dynamics of the system. Um, in practice, you wouldn't actually work with these very large mass matrices. You'd reduce the size of the model, but that's kind of another hour of talk. So let's not worry about it for now. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to move that whole model from a second order set of ODEs into uh, two sets of first order ODEs, because in order to use a state space model and to keep the Markov property and stuff, I need them to be first order. Uh, and so this is quite a standard thing you can do by just extending the state. And hopefully people have seen this before. Right? This is also how you would solve a second order system with like Runga cutter or something like that, if you're familiar. And my inputs also end up in the same way. So then if we remember, my trick is going to be that I'm going to assume that this unknown force U is some Gaussian process that I haven't directly observed. Uh, and it has some covariance function. In this case, it's going to be matern because it's finite times differentiable and all the maths works out nicely. Um, and then I'm going to turn that GP also into a state space form. And it introduces this WT term, which is just a continuous time white noise. Um, so this is now a continuous time uh, SDE rather than ODE. And the L is just controlling how that randomness enters into my system. And there's another nice interpretation of the Gaussian process that hasn't yet been 
used on the summer school, which is that you can say that a Gaussian process is a linear filter on a continuous time white noise process. And that's exactly what you see here, um, which is like another interpretation of Gaussian processes. Um, and what we see is that the white noise is going to enter the system and it's going to be filtered through this bit with the lambdas in, which are, the lambda is um, uh, proportional to the length scale of my process, or inversely proportional to the length scale. It's going to be filtered through there, and then it's going to filter up through my structural dynamics in the top left, my M's and my K's and my C's. And then what I'm actually going to observe is this acceleration state, the X double dot. So I'm not going to be able to look at all of these things directly. I'm going to have partial state observation onto the acceleration state. Are people kind of happy with that? Uh, that's a good question. For now, linear. Um, if we have time at the end, I'll show you the nonlinear case, but the inference is a bit harder. Okay. It's a good question, though. So in this case, linear, and for these kind of offshore structures, people often assume the linear dynamics is, the, uh, is a kind of good enough assumption, even though we know it's not true. Okay, so here's what happens when you run the model. And so as I said, what we actually do is we observe... Um, the acceleration in a few locations on that structure. So in maybe eight points, we observed the acceleration. And this is actually from a synthetic example so that we knew exactly what the force should have been so we could kind of prove that the method works. And then we, in order to solve this model, um, you have this, this SDE, you convert that to discrete time because we can't operate on it as a continuous time object. And then the solution to this is as simple as running a Kalman filter followed by the corresponding smoother, which are both quite standard things to do. Are people familiar with Kalman filters? Have we all run, run a Kalman filter? OK. Um, if you want to derive the Kalman filter, you can also go through Carl Hemrick's worksheet on Gaussians, because it's still just conditioning Gaussians. Um, OK. So what you get out the end, and this is looking at one of those latent states. So this is looking at the latent state which is the force U that I couldn't measure directly. So I was looking at the acceleration of my system, uh, and what I'm interested in is the forcing um, that was applied to that system, because that tells me something about the, the fatigue damage accrual. Um, and you can see it lines up really well. If you like putting numbers to things, this is a 1% like, normalized mean squared error, which is pretty good. Um, Someone will ask what we did with the hyperparameters and the, the MCK matrices. We actually ran MCMC over all of those over the top of the linear state space model. But I didn't really want to talk about MCMC today, so I'm not going to. Okay, but we did do it, and we were very Bayesian, and now we don't do it because I think there's, it's not that. <laughs> it doesn't make that much difference. Um, and what you see if you inspect um, the recovered force, so this is like the time series of the force that I couldn't measure, um, is that it, it agrees really well you know, in metrics-wise, it's like 1% error. When you look at it, it's still doing pretty well, and our confidence intervals are, are, are very reasonable. If you were to draw samples from this GP, they would look, look pretty similar to what you've got in your measurement or what the truth would be. Yeah, sure. Is there anything weird going on when, when you the uh, Ah, okay, yeah. So because we ran MCMC, we, we ran MCMC over the hyperparameters as well. And so what I'm showing you is actually... Um, We've propagated the samples of the hyperparameters through the inference, and then this is the first two moments of whatever comes out of that. Um, so the hyperparameters are hopefully taken care of. What you will notice is that the GP, um, it does smooth some of the high-frequency content out, and it kind of attributes that to just being noise. So if you cared about this very high-frequency variation, then maybe um, it's not doing perfectly. But really, that's kind of nitpicking, because the alternative is that we know nothing. So it's kind of better than nothing which is hopefully the bare minimum we should aim for. Okay, so that was just to kind of get us in the mood of what you could do with this kind of latent force model and to kind of say uh, that the model does work and, it, and someone else has gone away and reproduced it, that being me, and it's, it's a really nice model. It's really good fun. So now what I'm going to talk about is how you might want to uh, use that kind of form of model to recover um, the ODE of... Uh, or a single ODE of a, a simplistic system. So just a single ODE in this case. Um, and we're going to rely actually on an idea that's, that's really old. Um, 
And there's a very nice paper, 1979, I recommend reading it if you care about this kind of thing, by Masri and Cowie. Um, and they made what's kind of a simple observation, which is, um, if I look at a, a nonlinear system, and f for now I'm going to consider that my, my systems are all second order, because I'm, you know, I'm a mechanical engineer. Um, and I'm going to assume there's an underlying linear component, that's this MCK part, plus some other nonlinear component. So I've made some quite strong assumptions here about the type of ODEs that I'm dealing with. Um, but what they said was basically, if you measured U and you knew X, double dot, X dot, and X, then your missing bit is just whatever you take away, right? Which is kind of an obvious thing, but it's like a nice observation. And they call this a restoring force method, uh, which, is, which is nice. Okay. The problem with this is that you need to have observations of all of these states. Like, I need to know x, I need to know x dot, I need to know x double dot, and I need to know u. And I don't often have all of those things. Um, and when the data are noisy, um, stuff like numerical differentiation, numerical integration over that uh, can be very tricky, and I can get very bad estimates coming out. So um, we're going to kind of apply the ideas of the latent force problem to think about how we could use that to solve this type of problem. Um, and so remember, the latent force model looks like this, some linear ODE with a force that's unknown, and it's modeled as a GP. Um, in latent restoring force, then, we're just going to say, okay, well, the thing I'm interested in is this function of the states, f of x and x dot, that's some nonlinear function I don't know. That's really hard to get towards, and the reason it's really hard to get to is that I'd have to try lots of models where there's an interaction between the unknown states and the unknown function. And it gets very, very slow to do the optimization there. So instead, I'm going to decouple my problem, and I'm going to say the first thing I'd like to do is, rather than estimating that nonlinear component in the ODE, I'm going to estimate the influence of that nonlinear component. So I'm going to take what is an internal force of the nonlinear spring, and I'm going to treat it as a missing nonlinear input. So I'm going to say there was some extra force coming from somewhere that was pushing my system around, and I don't know what it is. Uh, and then we're going to try and do inference over that missing component, that missing input, and over the parameters of the linear part at the same time. So conceptually, that's the idea. Uh, do people follow that as a concept? There's a couple of people nodding, so I'll take that as a win. Uh, and, and just because um, if you know the group in Sheffield, we always use this uh, duffing oscillator as a test case, which also the fits in the Gumo model. Um, it's fun, but uh, we should test it. We also test, um, there's some stuff we've done where we test it on more interesting nonlinearities, like hysteretic nonlinearities that include, that add an additional state into this thing, but we don't have time today. Okay, so we do the exact same thing. Um, so we take that missing component, the R that I just wrote up, we turn that into a state space form of the GP, we link that up to the linear part of our dynamics, and we perform joint inference over um, the physical states, which are the displacement, the velocity, and over that missing uh, force state. And what you see is, even in, and this is, we, in this case, again, ran MCMC over the the linear module parameters and the hyperparameters, again, probably not the best thing to do in practice. Um, and what you recover is something that looks a bit like this, which is we get very confident, very accurate estimates of the physical states, and we get kind of okay estimates of that missing force component. And if you look closely, and probably it's a little bit small on the screen, you actually find that we underestimate the missing force quite severely. Um, well, not severely, but enough to be bothered. So if you go in and you investigate um, what's happening, we can look at the total restoring force now. So what I've done is I've summed together the linear parts uh, with that estimated R, and that really well agrees with what should be the total amount of restoring force in the, in the model. Uh, and that's very reassuring for me because that means that I've captured basically all of the dynamic behavior of that system, and I've sort of recovered all the things that I need to use that, those ideas of Masri and Kawi. I've got the displacement, velocity, acceleration, and the input. Um, and so what I can do now is to just plot out that nonlinear component. And so the only data that I've seen 
is this time series data, which is very difficult to interpret. It's hard for me to say, yeah, this is a cubic nonlinearity in this model. But by running this first step where I infer the contribution of the nonlinearity, I can then look at the space where there's correlation between my states and that nonlinearity. And this is that function I really want to learn, that f of x and x dot, that defines the nonlinearity in my ODE. And if I can get this function, then I can simulate forever for any input, if I got it perfectly right. Um, but what you see on the left is the thing that was causing me to underestimate that force in the first place, which is that my MCMC actually ends up being biased, uh, and I end up underestimating the linear stiffness of the model. Um, sorry, overestimating the linear stiffness of the model. Um, and this is because there's kind of a tension between the linear parts of my model and the Gaussian process, and they're fighting over who gets to explain the behavior. And uh, Gaussian processes are really greedy. They just love to model data. They really love it. And I, I think this is observed in the emulator community, right? That you, if you have a Gaussian process as your discrepancy function, it can actually then bias your parameters because it just loves to model the data. And that's kind of what we're seeing here. The good news is that um, we're now going to fit a parametric model for our ODE because we'd like to make predictions into the future, and it's nice if that's parametric. So we do kind of like a model order selection, and then, and then in this case, we pull out that we should have a cubic term. Um, and what you get in the end after doing that and removing this linear bias that we can do because we can just transfer it across is you get a really nice model of the, of the nonlinearity in that system. And the cool thing about this is um, that it will run in, well, if you don't do the MCMC, but if you don't run the MCMC, it will run in like 10 seconds on your laptop. Which is, which is pretty exciting if you've ever tried to fit nonlinear ODEs where you don't know the function that's underneath. Okay. Just to test what's going on, uh, what we did is we took a new input to that system, like a completely different forcing. So we kind of shook it around in a different way to what we'd seen in any of the training data, and then we predicted what the response of that oscillator would be going forwards in time. So this is like, imagine us going into that region I showed at the beginning where the GP just went to zero and the confidence intervals grew. And what you find is a linear model does a kind of, I don't know, kind of okay, kind of rubbish, probably rubbish, about 75% error. And then the recovered nonlinear model that we get does 0.2% error, which is the noise floor. Um, so that's kind of exciting. Uh, and... What this means is that we could now predict the response of this system going forward in time indefinitely. Like we can just keep going for any arbitrary input I want to do. Um, yeah, Mauricio. So you, you set up motivation, but it's, I think, what you want to do with extrapolation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but you also, now by doing this, you sort of lose a bit the interpretation of the model. So, for example, what about that parameter M and that parameter you know, So this model actually is using those parameters that we've inferred. So actually we keep now, we're now back in a parametric model. So I can tell you that like the cubic term here has a coefficient of 988. It should have been 1,000, but it's pretty close. And like I can tell you the linear coefficient terms now. So when I come to do this like uh, prediction and I'm going into the future, now I've gone back to a fully physical parametric model. So I've kind of, to make this prediction, I've actually just ditched the GP. So I kind of used the GP in the region where it was good, which was to interpolate across the time points that I had and to recover what the contribution of the nonlinearity is. But now to go forward, I can't keep using the GP. Actually, you can, but I'll show you that in a second. But we don't use a GP in time at all to make this prediction because we've run into that extrapolation problem. So this is now a parametric physical model. But we've recovered the form of that model with information that the GP gave us. Uh, Henry, did you have a question? Can you just clarify how you do that? So how do you go from the GP to the parameter? Yeah, sure. So um, the GP in the state space, I've, I've run inference, and I get uh, posterior distributions over all the states. Um, and I know, I know that my system is, a, is an ODE, and this 
this equation at the bottom is really simple to fit, right? It's just a linear in the parameters model. The issue that I had to start with is I didn't have all of the input variables. I didn't have the velocity and the displacement. So what the GP has effectively done for me in the latent force model is to estimate all the inputs to this equation, uh, which are all these states that I can now, and if I'm worried, I can sample from these state posteriors as well to try and account for the uncertainty in that estimate of the states. The kind of miraculous thing is that even though your model is really not the right model, it's not physical, you still get very, very confident and correct recovery of the states. That's kind of helping us a lot here. And then once I have all these states, I'm going to use, um, so the displacement is x, the velocity is x dot, the force is um, whatever should be in that x cubed term. I'm just going to solve a linear in the parameters regression model. In this case, we just ran over a polynomial basis and did very boring model selection stuff. But we're... So what we've done is to say, use the GP to get to all the states that I can't see. And then after that, solve a much simpler regression problem. Because I can fit this regression without needing to do lots and lots of ODE solves that are really annoying to do. Even though they're relatively quick, they're still not as quick as linear in the parameters <laughs> regression. So you, you get the GP and then actually do all of those Yeah, so yeah. Yeah, exactly, yeah. In this case, apart from it's also, the nice thing is it's also estimating this kind of missing nonlinear component, um, which is sometimes tricky to do. Um, yeah, and then here, this is now a parametric prediction because we used that information to fit a parametric model. Okay, cool. Do you include uncertainty in this plot? Because I would expect the further you... Uh, we haven't plotted the uncertainty here. Um, what you need to do is to propagate now the uncertainty on the MCK K3 parameter through the ODE solver. So actually, the uncertainty won't just grow over time. Um, it, yeah. In practice, it won't just explode in the same way as in the first plot I showed you. Because your, this, this equation here, uh, let's just have a look at this cubic, we don't leave the interpolation region of this cubic very often unless I start pushing the system a lot harder. So, and actually, because I've made it parametric, I can extrapolate, because I got the term right. But, yeah. Maybe we'll crack on if that's okay. Cool. Okay, so th that was kind of nice. Um, but again, as you heard earlier, real systems don't have one second order ODE governing them, unless you're really lucky. Um, they have lots of ODEs. Uh, and they have lots of other problems. And so what I'd like to show you is kind of a few extensions that we're working on to make this as practical as possible in an actual useful sense. Um, OK. Uh, so the first thing you might think is, OK, but what if I have a scenario where you don't have access to either those inputs or that nonlinearity? You're, you're stuffed, right? Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to make some assumptions here which are co very common in uh, kind of structural dynamics in order to try and solve this problem of inferring that nonlinearity at the same time as inferring some unknown uh, forcing inputs. Okay, so we're going to do the exact same thing that we did before, but now I just have two Gaussian processes, right? I have a Gaussian process on my missing nonlinear component, and I have a Gaussian process on my missing input. Um, and there is an identifiability problem here, but we are able to solve that by choosing kernels for each one that leaves them identifiable, which is really nice. And then because the sum of any two GPs is still a GP, uh, we get the, actually we have the exact same setup as a regular latent force model, just with a particular form of the kernel that we're interested in. And then what we're going to do is we're going to say uh, we can look at the structure of the state space that's given by the fact that we know stuff about this physical system to start to separate out uh, what could be an internal contribution versus an external contribution. Uh, and so what we see, if you look at this model, and I've written it in the continuous time, but when you um, go to discrete time, it stays the same, uh, is that this zero in the bottom left of the block of this matrix tells me that there shouldn't be, 
there should be like a zero relationship from my states to my inputs, right? So um, intuitively or physically, what I'm saying is that um, the motion of my system, like the motion of my uh, wind turbine, shouldn't affect the forces that are being applied to it. So the waves are pushing that around regardless of how it's moving. If you know anything about fluid dynamics, you'll tell me that that's not true, but it's a very common assumption that we can make. Okay, so we're going to say that it's moving around relatively so little to the flow that the flow is acting entirely on that system and there's no feedback into the flow. Okay, so that is quite important here. And what that means is that if I look at the, um, the, the correlation between my states, X, and my recovered force, like there should be no correlation there, right? Because it's just being pushed around entirely independently. And any correlation that you find must be a result of something missing in this f, x, x dot term. Okay. It's a little bit weird to get your head around, so you might just want to marinate that a little bit. I'll show you uh, what it looks like. So this is what we, we run the exact same thing. I haven't plotted any um, confidence intervals here because I was being lazy when I made the plots, so I'm sorry. Um, uh, and what we get, and kind of remarkably again, is you still get very, very good recovery of those physical states. So you still get very good recovery of the displacement and the velocity. And then if you look at this R hat, so this is a system that's been forced with a white noise. So that's our assumption is that white noise is being pushed into the system. And then we have a matter and kernel over the, the, the forcing. Um, is you see that you get the recovery here is definitely not white noise, right? And so what you're seeing is a superposition of that white noise, which was the input to my system, and the missing dynamics that I should have had in my equation. And we're going to do the exact same thing, and we're going to look at the correlation between uh, the displacement and the velocity states and that um, force that we've recovered. And any correlation you find in there has to be a result of something missing from your, um, from your equation of motion, from your ODE. In this case, somebody asked, okay, well, what if you don't know if you have a cubic or whatever, you don't want to do parametric model fits? Um, as I said at the beginning, when all you have is the Gaussian process, we can just fit this function with the Gaussian process, right? And in this case, you know, like, um, we get away with a little bit of extrapolation because the length scale is really long, but in general, this might not be a great idea because it's unlikely that that function will return to zero mean, okay? But this actually works really well, and we just wanted to prove because some reviewers were like, well, hang on a minute, you're a non-parametric Bayesian and you just fitted a cubic function, what's up with you? Um, we wanted to just show that you could use a GP here if you really wanted. You could use a neural net, you could use whatever you like. The point is that we turn a complicated dynamic learning problem into a simple static regression. And we have hundreds of tools to, do that, to solve that. Uh, again, maybe just of interest again, is that you um, see linear bias, which you need to correct that one if you care about the underlying parameters of that linear system, um, which is an interesting point. Okay. Cool. We're actually not so bad on time. Is it, it's 22, right? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so the last thing then that I wanted to show you um, was what happens if you have more than one degree of freedom. And so for us, um, that's when we have more than one ODE that's interacting which is pretty common. That's kind of how things normally actually are. You, you barely ever can get away with just saying this is one equation. Um, and so we set up kind of these simple-ish simple, simple -ish test cases, and anywhere you see an arrow is where I've put some nonlinear function in, and we put a different nonlinearity in each one. Like one of them is cubic in the stiffness, one is quadratic in the damping, one of them I think is a hysteresis, so we're not, they're not all the same. And a question that mechanical engineers sometimes like to ask themselves is, on a big structure like my plane, where is the nonlinearity? So most of it is going to behave fairly linearly, right? So if I have like a, like a long piece of metal and it's not moving very much, that's going to behave pretty much linearly. But if I have something like a shock absorber, that's probably going to behave quite nonlinearly. It, but it's not always as intuitive as that. And you might want to have a tool that tells you whereabouts physically in the system does your nonlinearity pop up. And so what we're going to do is we're going to basically take the same idea. This is a nice talk because there's only really one thing you need to get the hang of. And we're going to again put into the state space now 
lots of these missing forces, right? Because I have lots of equations, each one has a missing force. That's not actually enough, uh, because again, we could exchange that uh, missing force between any of them and still get the same result, and that would be kind of upsetting. But because, again, we have physical insight, and this is like an argument for including as strong prior knowledge as you can into these things, because we have physical insight, we know that this top right corner is actually very structured. And we're going to use um, every action has an equal and opposite reaction in order to build a very structured matrix here. So let's just make that clear. If I look at this K2, if I stretch that K2, it's going to be pulling mass 1 to the right but it's going to be pushing mass 2 back to the left. So there's an equal and opposite force that's generated by those nonlinear components. Uh, and so I'm going to impose that prior physical knowledge by having a very structured way that my Gaussian process enters into my linear dynamics. Um, and that's going to make the whole thing much nicer to identify. And this is the plot that comes out at the end. I've not plotted the, um, the, the structural states, the velocities, the displacements, um, suffice to say, they look pretty much on top. What we're interested in, though, is these five missing forces that are kind of, was there a nonlinearity? And if so, what was its contribution? And what we see is exactly what we would hope, which is that we start kicking off the Gaussian process in the regions where we know that there's nonlinearity in the system. So now I have a tool that is hopefully able to help me both detect whether my system is linear. And I haven't shown it, but you can, um, if you switch off all the nonlinearity, all the Gaussian processes stay at zero with very low variance. So it's like a nice detector of whether your linearity assumption is good. Uh, but when there is nonlinearity, they start to kick off and they, they start to show me not just what the influence is, but where the influence is in my system. And that can be really helpful for me as an engineer who then wants to maybe go back and do some design work. Okay. Um, hopefully I've sold you that Mauricio is a very clever guy <laughs> and the GPLFM is a really nice model. Um, you can do all kinds of cool stuff with it. The things that I didn't cover today was what happens when your underlying system is known to be nonlinear. Uh, we can do that if someone really wants. There are some appendix slides because I'm well prepared. Um, what I didn't tell you is what a pain it is to actually compute. <laughs> And like a lot of these things with GPs, the, the devil is really in the detail of how you implement the, the problem. So in order to get these filters and smoothers and things to compute, there's quite a lot of annoying maths and matrices that are very close to not being invertible and a lot of jitter. So we run this all using like square root forms of the Kalman filter and various stuff to try and make it compute without blowing up. So if you do want to go away and do it, uh, just a word of warning that... You can run into numerical problems when you try to actually implement these things. I think that's true of pretty much all these GP models, and we don't really say it that much in the talks because it sort of detracts from the nice results. So it would be good if I just stopped here and was like, hey, <laughs> amazing. In practice, though, you have to be very careful. And so when I was doing my postdoc, um, my friend Lawrence, who's doing really exciting research at Turing Institute now, um, left this jar on my desk. Uh, as I was trying to get these things working, and in the end it paid for us to actually have a very nice potted plant uh, in the office. Um, so there's my word of warning for you, but if you do want to try this, come and talk to me and I can share some of the, the secrets if you want. Um, great. Here's some references. That doesn't matter. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Hopefully I've kind of shown you one aspect of something you might want to do inside a digital twin. I've not shown you a digital twin today. I've shown you an interesting science problem that you could use as part of a wider framework. Um, so before anyone's upset about that, um, I'm happy for questions. Thank you very much. Um, because the kernel, 
the, here's what's quite conceptually confusing, I guess. Um, so the kernel that you choose in, let's go back to a slightly. The kernel that I choose for R here is the kernel with time as an input. So here I need a kernel that captures how does the contribution of that term vary in time. So that, I don't know a lot about that. I just know that it's kind of nonlinear. So I'm trying to choose a kernel to model this function at the bottom, in the bottom pane here. And kind of a night, exactly this regression is what we're doing, from the time to the force. So I need a kernel that will capture functions that look a little bit like this. We can argue about whether a matern is a great choice for that, but it's good enough. Um, but this behavior is clearly not cubic. It, like, if I put a cubic kernel in there, <laughs> it would just kind of go like this. And that's not what I want here, because I have a zero mean process. When I then come to the second step, I'm no longer using time as an input to my regression problem. So I want, right at the beginning I told you, using time is not a great idea because you end up extrapolating. So I've dropped the time, and now the model that I'm fitting is a model where the inputs are the displacement and maybe the velocity, if I think there's a component in that, against that force that I recovered. So this force is the posterior that I pull out of that GP, but I've dropped all my dependence on time now. So I'm doing a regression from a different set of variables. Um, so kind of the kernel that I'm choosing when I pick a matern is I'm picking a kernel that's going to represent this function well. And if you look at it, matern's not a bad choice here. It's not, there's probably something someone very clever could do that's, that's better than that, but matern's not a bad choice here because you have something that is stationary, is zero mean, has some nonlinear components, and is continuous. It's, it's not a bad choice. Um, but when I then come to actually fit this parametric model, that's no longer the case, right? Because I've changed completely what my inputs are. So I've kind of got two different regression problems. Um, does, does that sort of clear it up a little bit? Yeah. They have fewer, computationally, they're easier to solve, right? right? Because it's cubic and... Uh, I, in practice, we just pick 3 over 2 or 5 over 2, and it's fine, which I think is what almost everyone does. And if someone complains about it in a review, we just cite Stein's book. Um, <laughs> where I think he just offhand says, oh, matin kernels are nice. Yeah. Do you have a feeling for which one is better? So here we've used well, all zero mean, right? Because we kind of assumed black but, box. But effectively, because you're using an old GP with a Gaussian process, if you were to rewrite that as a Gaussian process, yeah. it would be a Gaussian process with an old GE mean and some covariance. Yeah, so Mauricio is the expert on how to write down the covariance function, which is the GPLFM covariance function. So you can write down a covariance matrix from what I understand, Mauricio. I'm very sorry, I haven't ever actually done it like that. <laughs> um, but you can write down the covariance function, which is including the ODE and that Gaussian process. It, it becomes a little bit nasty, which I think is why I didn't do it. It's a bit tricky to code. Is the ODE not in the covariance? The ODE is in the mean. Uh, is the ODE in the covariance, Mauricio? Or in the mean? Uh, yeah, in the covariance. Well, in the Yeah. Yeah. Um, no. Yeah. Maybe we could. We could go through it. Yeah. Uh, maybe I misunderstood something, but uh, when we get the final parametric model, we use to make predictions. 
Mm -hmm. That can also extrapolate to different initializations of the system, yep. as long as the force, uh, they are not ported with Philip using the GP, doesn't depend on the system state, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, you can think of it like this, which is if you've done your job correctly, what you end up with at the end is the actual ODE of the system. Okay. Right? So if, if you're really lucky, okay, and I, I want to stress that if you're really lucky, you might hope that, so the model I'm making my prediction with is the actual ODE of my system. In which case, I'm now just in a simulation mode, and if that ODE is correct, you know, perfect in some way, for any initial conditions or any inputs, I can simulate it. Whatever my favorite way of doing that is. Runga cutter is pretty popular, right? Um, because it's now just a parametric ODE. Um, where you should be careful, then, is if you got it wrong, right? Because if you get it wrong, then you're in big trouble um, because it's then a parametric model that's incorrectly specified and your predictions will be potentially nonsense. And that could be amplified by the fact that you're then feeding that incorrect model through some kind of runga cutter scheme. The one where maybe you need to be a little bit more careful is if instead of fitting a parametric model, I used a GP. So say I used a GP instead of trying to do model selection and pick a cubic here. If I now push my system too hard, so if I start with a higher excitation force, my displacements will get larger, and I'm in the same extrapolation region of the GP. So I leave the training set, my variance increases, and my mean returns to the prior, whatever that prior is. Um, probably in practice, you might want to do like a combination of these two. So you might want to have, say, uh, a linear or polynomial mean on the GP here, potentially. Because um, you're hopefully a little bit more protected against that time when your displacements are getting too big for your GP to make very reliable predictions. Um, so that's just something to, to be aware of. So I've thought about it, and I haven't done it. Um, my concern would be uh, you'd have to be a little bit careful that you, again, don't break the rules of the covariance function that you choose for this force. So I have a, a friend who's um, at Cambridge now called Alice Cicciarello. She wanted to use this model for identifying friction systems, so systems with slip stick in them. And the problem there is that the force now that you're trying to learn is no longer a continuous function. It can, it can jump because of this stick slip in the friction. Um, and so they wrote this really nice paper, and their solution to that was actually to replace the GP here with a switching model, so multiple GPs that it switches between, to get those jumps in there. Um, so I think the, the dangerous thing, or the worry I would have about a chaotic system is whether, you can, whether this function stays nicely behaved enough that you can learn it with a GP in time. You can always plot it and look, and if it looks nice, you could give it a go. Um, we have done it with um, like a hysteretic system, um, so like the Buchfen hysteresis model. Uh, the problem with that is that this then is no longer a static function. So this thing then is actually also another ODE that you don't know. <laughs> so what am I going to do? You can take a wild guess of how we solve that, <laughs> right? <laughs> Sorry? The, the, one that the friction one? Yeah. Um, I don't know if the friction one would help with the hysteresis, if that was the question. Um, but with the hysteresis, you can actually just do the same procedure again, because you look at this and you go, well, that's definitely not a static function, so let's see if it's got a dynamic behavior in it as well. <laughs> just keep going forever. Cool. OK, great. Got that, That's hard. You said it was numerically infinity. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. I haven't tried, um, so I I, w I don't know. Um, but I guess 
So the, yeah. Yeah, so the numerical issue... Oh, sorry, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so the numerical issue comes from the fact that your um, state covariance matrices that you estimate in the Kalman filter become very close to not being positive definite. Um, oh, they can become very, very small. So when, my, when I'm doing... You know, in these plots, you can see the variance is really tiny on the estimation. So there are confidence intervals on here. Um, so you get matrices we'd like in the covariance matrix where you have very small entries for these displacement of velocity states, but then quite big entries for the force state. So that matrix is just a little bit fiddly to invert sometimes. Um, I, I don't know if it would be any easier if you took the whole, the whole GP um, LFM model and put it in a kernel. I, uh, again, we maybe should chat to Mauricio about whether that would work. <laughs> I'm sort of throwing you under the bus here to solve everyone's problems. <laughs> Great. Okay, so we'll break for lunch now. We'll start again at 2 o'clock. We've got two talks this afternoon. But before we do, let's just thank Tim again. Thanks.